Hello and welcome to our panel on development. I'm really blessed to have with me today a really interesting group of investors and developers, and I want to introduce them to you right now. But first, to introduce myself, I'm John Jacobson, otherwise known as Jake. I run the capital markets area at related companies here in New York City. I've been in the real estate investment business for about 30 years now, um, eight of those here uh, at Related. And my involvement in development really stretches those entire 30 years. Um, my involvement in development and investment also intersects with many of the panelists on this panel. Um, the first of whom I'd like to introduce is Philip Jesue. Philip, you wanna introduce yourself? Sure. Um, <clears throat> my name is Philip Jesue. I'm the Chief Development Officer of Strategic Capital. Strategic Capital is a wholly owned U.S. subsidiary of a firm called CSCEC, or the China State Construction and Engineering Corporation. It's a publicly traded company in China and a state-owned company. Um, our mission is to invest core capital in the United States. Uh, we focus primarily in the New York City tri-state area. Um, and in other areas uh, where we're in um, uh, operational businesses. Uh, we're a conglomerate that owns uh, construction companies, um, civil engineering firms, and uh, a whole plethora of real estate and construction oriented activities. Um, I've been in the business for about 25 years um, and uh, have been um, active in development for most of those 25 years. Thanks, Philip. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce everybody to uh, Craig Kogut, who I will say I first met back when I first moved back to the East Coast in 1993 and was working at the time for uh, what was then called Apollo Real Estate Advisors. And, and Craig was a, a partner at Apollo at the same time. So, Craig? Thank you. Those, so that you just dated me here, Jake. So thank you. Um, so I've been and in business son. for, <laughs> I was a little more, well, yes. Uh, so I've been involved as a private equity investor um, in various businesses. I was one of the founders of Apollo. I left to found my current firm, Pegasus, in 1996. And we focus broadly in two areas, sustainability and health and wellness, as well as the intersection often of those two. Um, that leads us, um, in the case of real estate, to work a lot um, on the development side with things that relate to energy, energy efficiency on the sustainability side. Um, but also um, on health and wellness, particularly in the hotel sector, where we were the owner of a firm called Six Senses, which we recently sold to IHG. So in the context of development, it cuts across all sectors, more on the product side, but on the, on the health and wellness side, um, being a developer of a brand. Thanks, Craig. Um, about 13 years or so, maybe a little later, after I met Craig at Apollo, by that time, we had changed the name of Apollo Real Estate Advisors to Area Property Partners, and I had the great fortune to work with Andrew Holm. Andrew, you want to introduce yourself? Memory's pretty good, Jake. It was uh, 2006, so that would have been 13 years later uh, that I joined up. It was still Apollo Real Estate then. We uh, changed it shortly thereafter. I got the offer letter to prove it. Um, 15 years later, I'm still in the same job, though the firm's name has changed. So I'm now a partner in the real estate group at Aries Management. Um, Aries is a large diversified investment management firm, publicly traded. Um, I head up our Northeast acquisitions as well as uh, co-head our opportunistic fund. And out of those series of funds over the last 10 years or so, we've been an investor in probably eight or $9 billion of ground up development projects, different asset classes across the country, usually in partnership with local developers. And finally, Kevin Cullinan. Now, Kevin uh, obviously is here to provide the lender's perspective on the development business. Uh, and to continue the theme a little bit, Kevin works, uh, he's the head of investments at Mac, Real Estate Credit Strategies, which is part of the Mac Real Estate Group, uh, which was created in 2013 when Aries purchased the old area property partners. I don't know, it gets very complicated after this point, but Kevin and I, uh, for the last seven or eight years, actually officed right across the hall from each other because Mac Real Estate Group and Related officed together at Columbus Circle um, until November of 
this past year when uh, when Related moved down to our new headquarters at Hudson Yards. So, Kevin? Thanks, Jake. So, Kevin, calling in, as, as Jake mentioned, uh, I'm a managing director at Mac Real Estate Group, which is a vertically integrated owner, operator, developer, and lender. Um, I uh, co-head our credit strategies business where I oversee our originations um, across North America. Um, we have capital that invests across the, um, the stack. And um, oftentimes we find ourselves in, in development projects with groups like Jake or others on this call. So just to set up the conversation, as I was thinking about our discussion, um, I was thinking that we really want to touch on what our view is toward committing resources to development over the next one, two, or three years. And by resources, uh, I mean equity in the case of equity investors, uh, debt, um, or really human resources. How do you commit your firm to new development deals, uh, especially given that we um, are presumably coming uh, to the end of the pandemic? Um, just as an overview, um, I, I wanted to make an observation that we've seen here in our business at Related. Um, we obviously have spent the better part of the last 10 years developing Hudson Yards, which was heavily focused on commercial um, and also somewhat focused on residential. Um, what surprised us over the prior cycle was how well office buildings performed uh, as we were developing them and how um, relatively retail, which we thought would be a, a real bright spot, um, did not perform as well as, as the office did on a, on a relative basis. And the residential was, was somewhere in the middle. Now we're in a market that, you know, to my mind, having been in the business for a long time, is a little bit topsy-turvy. Because now what used to be considered specialized property types, um, like data centers, like single family rental, like life science, like cold storage, those have now become sort of the prime property types that institutional investors around the country and around the world uh, are really interested in investing in. And in order to get many of those product types, um, you know, they're willing to invest in uh, ground up development of those product types. Um, here at Related, you know, our focus continues to be on residential, commercial, mixed use, but we as well are now spending a lot more time, a lot more of our human capital on things like uh, energy and sustainability, um, close in uh, logistics in urban areas. Uh, our group in Boston has a, a very major focus on life science and, and has for, um, for about 40 years. So uh, in my mind, our focus on development as a development company, obviously we're still gonna focus on development, but the things that we're prioritizing and the things we're deciding to spend time on are different now than they were a year ago or certainly five years ago. So, um, and, and I haven't pre-figured uh, uh, exactly who would go first, but I thought I would tap Andrew first um, to sort of talk about how priorities may have changed what are you looking at now as we are presumably emerging from the pandemic? Sure. And so to contextualize that for a second, over the last nine or 10 years, probably 60% or so of the equity we invested in development went into multifamily. Probably 25% or so went into hospitality. And thankfully, largely sold in 2018 and 2019. Um, and the balance was probably split between office and mixed use. Um, you know, we definitely had a feeling 18 to 24 months ago that we were deliberately starting to ramp down our development exposure just out of a view of where we might be in a cycle and that valuations might correct. Um, I think one of the surprises over the last nine months in some ways has been how quickly we've been eager to get back into ground up development in a period of significant dislocation. Um, so we are dedicating a lot of resources to it, a lot of capital to it, even in the immediate um, post pandemic period. So between uh, probably July of last year and today, 
we've committed to about a billion dollars of ground up industrial transactions, uh, about 10 million square feet all over the country, a mix of pre leased and spec construction. Um, we are cautiously getting back into multi, but probably more in Sunbelt markets um, rather than, say, across the street from Hudson Yards, where we're under construction with a large multifamily tower. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if by the end of this year, if the sort of pandemic trends continue how they have been, um, we might actually break ground on our first post-pandemic hotel project. Um, and that, that may be the biggest surprise of all, um, given where we sat, you know, six months or a year ago. So what I hear from a lot of institutions is um, sometimes a bias, especially in a market like this, towards looking for distressed deals rather than ground up. Again, talking our own book, you know, we think a lot of the best development deals we've ever done are deals that we actually initiated during a downturn because they opened up into the upswing. Um, how do you guys have that debate internally about whether to focus on uh, on distress deals or, or plow ahead with, with development, at, you know, hopefully at the bottom of the cycle? So I, I would say, you know, a year ago, um, every conversation was where can we find distress? How soon will it start coming through? Um, every hotel in America is going to be a distressed hotel that, you know, supply is going to swamp demand and pricing is going to crater. Um, and similar for, say, New York City condominiums. I think one of the um, unique things about this crisis is, first of all, there's been no sense of moral hazard. Um, so, you know, lenders generally haven't been punished for kicking the can down the road that, in fact, they've actually been encouraged to work with borrowers. Um, the federal government reacted much more quickly and with much more liquidity to prop up the system than happened in 2008 or 2009. Um, and liquidity returned both from a debt market and an equity market perspective much sooner than we would have anticipated. And um, so I, I agree with you, we are looking for distress, um, but there's much less 12 months after the onset of a major economic dislocation event than I think we or other institutional investors anticipate. Philip, I wanted to uh, ask you, you know, on, on similar lines, um, you know, as Andrew said, the investment focus may have shifted, right? More industrial, less multifamily. Um, how has your view shifted, maybe in terms of geographically, because you've been you know, very focused on, on the uh, New York City and, and Jersey City area. Are you looking at different locations now um, or different sectors? Uh, we are. I mean, it, you know, what we're trying to figure out is what the net net of, you know, of the stimulus and the COVID is combined. I mean, we're looking for distressed deals. We believe long term in the New York metropolitan market. But I also think that we're trying to, you know, read through the tea leaves of a crisis where the where the market's gotten better, which is not usual in a crisis, you know, due to stimulus, which eventually is going to stop happening. And then, you know, there'll be a requirement for, you know, the market to support itself and for the performance that we've seen for the last, you know, six to 12 months to continue. And, um, um you know, I think I think we're trying to figure out uh, what level of discounting is appropriate today, and whether today really reflects the real market. So we see the stimulus as having propped up the market in general, so the prices aren't vastly different than than what they were, and they may not be reflective of what they should be or will be in a, in a year. So I think um, that's sort of one area of caution that we have in terms of looking at deals. And I think the other is, you know, trying to get a sense of what migration means, you know, on a macro and a micro level. Um, and I think within the New York State area or the in New York metropolitan region, you know, there's movement, you know, from Manhattan to Brooklyn and there's movement from Brooklyn to Jersey City and there's movement from these places to Stanford, Connecticut. And so I think there's opportunities within the markets that we're in. Um, we're trying to figure out now whether those are permanent opportunities or whether they're temporary opportunities. And, you know, we're, we're actively in the market on a couple of for sale um, uh, uh, 
the high rises now, this has been the most active spring selling season in forever, in a decade. And, uh, and it's interesting, we're getting people from Miami who moved to Miami from New York, who are coming back to New York to buy a condo. So you see all kinds of interesting trends in the market that give you pause as to, you know, how doomed Manhattan really is and how permanent, um, you know, people's decisions that they made during, during COVID really are. And, you know, as someone who's thought about all these things, you probably like you guys have, you know, wanting to be in Miami six months ago uh, for the winter, you know, now that things are getting nicer in New York and, you know, things are coming back to life, it's you realize why you live here. So I, I, I've said nothing in the last five minutes, but essentially we are looking at a lot of stuff right now and trying to figure out um, what the nexus of all those data points is. And I'm not sure that we know what it is today, but we're going to try to figure it out in the next few months. I'm curious, we've seen the same thing uh, on the condo side where, where things, I mean, for, first they really started to pick up at the end of 2019, the beginning of, of 2020, things were actually starting to look better. And then, you know, this whole thing happened. Um, but similarly, uh, starting, you know, real, almost at, at the beginning of the year in, in January, not even the spring, right? We're not even, not even really in the spring. Uh, things have picked up in a way that I would not have anticipated when we moved into our new office on November 6th. Um, do, is part of that the fact that uh, developers and owners have somewhat lowered their pricing expectations, or do you think it's more demand driven? I think it's I think it's both. I think that um, what's happened is that you know I think in Manhattan for sure, had the market not been soft prior to COVID you may not have the reduction in prices that you have today and you may not have the same level of demand. But I also think, you know, I, I'm actively involved in all elements of the business, including the marketing, which, are, you know, when you're a condo developer, you get very actively involved in the marketing. You know, the last flyer we sent out is, you know, the stock market's at 30,000, interest rates are at 2%. Where should you be putting your money? And I think that, I think that's what happened in January. I think that people woke up after the election and they realized that the stock market wasn't gonna go up forever, that real estate is probably a good play, that interest rates aren't gonna be low forever. And if you have you know, any kind of basic financial sensibility, those, those data points lead to making, maybe making a, a good real estate investment now, uh, you know, if you can buy right. And, and I think that's the challenge is, is, you know, is buying right. But yeah, I think people decided because I think people sort of decided that now's a good time to get back. And I'll tell you something else interesting. A lot of the buyers that we see, in addition to the people coming from Miami, they're hedge fund guys. They're very, very successful stock market guys who are buying for their kids and themselves. And these are guys who know them, you know, long lifelong New Yorkers who know the market and they're out in the market buying right now. And that, that's great. I like seeing that. Now, one of, the, one of the things I wanted to do, you know, on behalf of, of this entire panel is like once everybody's up and traveling again and everything is to uh, invite ourselves to the hotel that you guys own in Nassau uh, so we can actually go on a vacation and get some warm weather. But I'm, I'm wondering, um, that's kind of a segue into what's your perspective on, on markets, other markets in which you operate, in particular Texas, where I think you have some, some investments. We have an investment in Texas. Um, so we have not been, we, we acquired an asset in Texas with an intention of expanding in that market. And it was sort of uh, a while ago and, uh, um, and we never really, and that was in Houston. I think that was done during, um, you know, the last oil boom and the real estate boom in Texas in Houston in particular wound up being significantly bigger than the oil boom, as was the bust. So Houston has been pretty weak subsequent to that, and we have not expanded as much as we would have otherwise in that market. Um, so, you know, timing wise, we, we just, we didn't do well in, in the Houston market. We continue to like um, uh, uh, Texas long-term, but we've just been more actively focused on, you know, in the New York region now. So uh, have not been active there. So Craig, um, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about it related for a long time, and in particular in our relationship with Equinox, 
um, is focusing on wellness. Um, and as I mentioned early on, we've also, uh, uh, Steve Ross um, is very, very committed to sustainability, it's right up from, you know, sustainability, but right up from individual buildings to, you know, entire cities to global sustainability. Um, so I'm curious, you know, your perspective, both from the standpoint of being a, a private equity investor, but also investing in real estate and development, you know, how that plays out over the coming years uh, as you as you pick things to focus on. Well, I, I think um, we've we obviously as a firm focus in those two categories generally and because we, we thought they would be attractive in the market and pre pandemic that was happening. I think certainly on the health and wellness side, the pandemic has given this a huge shot in the arm. I should mention, I'm happen to be Steve's an investor with one of our companies creating healthy spacing. Actually, we're based on pioneering technology from Columbia Medical School. Um, but I, I think it's imperative now um, that all buildings make people feel safe, but more importantly, they feel healthy. Whether it, And that's whether it's a hotel or an office building, um, the quality of space and attracting people and attracting customers is, is I think, going to be a growing trend, certainly in the hospitality business. So they are, you know, in terms of, we have the luxury of being more focused and not being general real estate investors. Wellness real estate is, I think, going to be a tremendous growth area. Um, and sustainability, you know, I think, has, will benefit from the pandemic. It was happening anyway, but there's so much going on um, on the corporate side, driving uh, consciousness, um, and uh, particularly on the higher end, I, it, I think tenants care about it. And I think on, in the lodging space, it's a very important thing to particularly younger travelers. And, and really there's, I, I think people are gonna begin to ask questions about certification. You know, it's fine to say you're doing carbon stuff, but people are gonna wanna know how and transparency, I think will be a major brand advantage for those who do it right. So as you think about investment, does it make sense more in an environment like today to try to acquire existing and, and, and improve and make it more sustainable and more focused on wellness? Or, or is it better to start from scratch and do ground up? It's case by case. I mean, it, it's a matter, I think there are some amazing development opportunities, you know, particularly outside urban areas, um, it, but close to them for some of what we're focused on. But more generally, uh, the way we look at it, if we're looking to buy a hotel or build a hotel, we'll look at what's, what's the upside or not. Like uh, I think you suggested, there's real opportunity, I think, in working during this period. Well, some of the development deals we're working on have been slowed down, but we're, we're not unhappy about that, but the timing's actually working out. So it, it really is just a uh, risk return, time to develop. And uh, it, you know, if we can get a cheap price, great, and rebrand, but um, there aren't so many of those. You know, and we, we, we talked about, uh, we've talked about distressed a little bit already, and you have seen more than your fair share of distressed deals over the years, starting when I first met you, and everything was distressed, both on the corporate side and the real estate side in the early 1990s. Do you see this as a period in which there's kind of a lot of, you know, long hanging fruit in the distressed area, or is, is all of this stimulus sort of making that kind of a non-issue? I, you know, I think it's, it's a, I, I think it's, there is an issue, but it's nowhere near like the nineties were the golden. I mean, you know, I mean, you had a, it was hard not to make money. Um, as some of the founders of Aries know too, who were with us at Apollo. Um, you know, now I think it's much more selective. You have to work the properties. There's so much more money too. I mean, forget stimulus. I mean, there's so much more money sitting around. There's much more efficiency in the markets. So I, I think the, you know, the best types of distress deals are ones where you've followed them, you'll work them, and normally there's going to be a little more of an edge to them. Um, it's not just going to be simple financial distress where you work, walk in and say you've got an amazing deal. I mean, it's going to have to be you have an idea to make the property better. You're going to bring in a tenant, a huge tenant who can do it. it it's definitely not easy. So I think we, I do think we will see some more distress as people have stretched and stretched. And, um, you know, we, we are talking about a recovery, but you know, there's a real possibility we see another surge here, what that's going to do. No one knows, particularly in some foreign countries. So I, I don't think we're out of the woods yet um, in terms of particularly uh, getting people back. Just one little plot. I think cities are going to come back, though, um, much as Philip said, he's seeing with people. I mean, you know, we need to be in 
and obviously related beliefs that we need to be in cities. And on the corporate side, we're seeing that every day. I mean, people, companies don't function. And this is all great, but being by Zoom, but you need to be together. And we all want to be in cities. So, Craig, you, you rightly mentioned there's a lot of capital out there that's that's not just government stimulus, obviously, which which made me think of Kevin, uh, because I keep seeing statistics in which there's something like sixty billion dollars of capital sitting in credit-focused real estate funds, and that that may be a high number, it may be a low number. Um, you know, where are you seeing opportunity today, and on a relative basis, you know, how how interested are you in looking at ground-up development versus you know, sort of, you know, investments in existing stuff or stuff that needs shoring up post pandemic. Sure. Um, I think there's a, there's a tale of a couple different or a, t- a couple different ways to slice that pie um, where we're seeing opportunities today versus prior to the pandemic, um, mostly on the new origination front is in what we're, what we refer to as emerging primary markets. So um, think of places like Nashville and Austin and Denver and Raleigh, um, that were important markets and important you know, places of commerce prior to the pandemic, but we've certainly seen an acceleration of um, whether it's migration into these cities or job growth within these cities. So uh, we have been a lot more active in markets like that versus um, prior to the pandemic where we spent a lot more of our time um, in your traditional major gateway markets or major city gateway markets like New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco uh, and so forth. Um, we, uh, although I do think, and, and how we think about it is we'll continue to be very active on that, that front in these newer markets or, or emerging primary markets. But if there is, um, meaningful distress to come into the system, which I think we're all circling around the idea that it will be a little bit less, um, exacerbated than we were anticipating. We think it happens in the major markets. We think it happens in New York. We think it happens in San Francisco. We think it happens in Chicago, uh, and maybe a few others out there. Um, So as we're looking at what we're doing on the investment front or on the origination front, we're we're sort of bifurcating, whereas we think new business and and normal way growth and originations in in new markets and and focusing our distressed investing on on the major markets if and when um, those opportunities present themselves. Uh, In terms of development, uh, we we remain active in that space, lending into that space. For us, uh, we have the benefit, while, while we may not have all the upside of, of the other folks on the phone, we have the benefit of margin of error. Um, so we can lend, or, or we think about it as though if we can lend at 65 or 70% of replacement costs for what will ultimately be, ultimately be a best-in-class asset in one of these markets, um, that is perhaps even implementing you know, today's newest technology in terms of HVAC to, to attract tenancy post-pandemic, or, or you name it, or open spaces, um, we like the opportunity to be able to lend at, you know, a meaningful discount to 2019 valuations and a meaningful discount to replacement value in, in 2021, and ultimately have exposure to what we think will be the best assets in their, in their respective markets or asset classes when they deliver in 2022, 2023, 2024. Um, we were talking uh, a week or so ago uh, about a deal which was fascinating to me because it's the kind of thing that, that, that is on our minds all the time where, um, you know, you've got an office deal, I think, in Nashville. You know, so for a New York-centric crowd, you say, well, wh- why, would, why would we want to do that? So can, can you just shed some light on that kind of as a case study? Sure thing. Yeah. So look, we've, and I mentioned some of the markets that we've been more active in, Nashville being one of them. And one of the um, groups that was behind the development of a spec office building in Nashville had approached us about providing them financing that was during the pandemic. So we actually started talking to them prior to the onset of the pandemic and wound up closing on an office construction loan with them um, in the middle of 2020. Um, I think they really appreciated that. We, we, you know, I, I can say, you know, on this call, we probably did it because of the strength of our relationship with them and not necessarily because we wanted a, a spec construction loan um, in the middle of 2020. Um, But we do like the growth story there, right? We've seen corporate relocations. We've seen other companies that don't have, that haven't traditionally had a a presence there, um, relocating jobs there. Um, And we like, uh, and this isn't, you know, specific to Nashville or Tennessee, but we also like these favorable tax jurisdictions, um, whether it's income tax or business tax or corporate tax. Um, We think that that trend is here to stay. And, and, 
Um, people are going to vote with their wallets and, and want to live, especially if they think they can they can work remotely or not necessarily be tied to these you know these historical major urban areas. They're going to want to live in these friendlier tax jurisdictions, and um, we're making a bet on Nashville to be one of the beneficiaries of that. So, I, I want to go down the path a little bit to talk about hotels, and I'm going to circle back to Andrew and Craig on this, but. Uh, my understanding is you, you would actually look at a, a hotel deal in this market as well. And, and as we all know, along with retail, hospitality is the other asset class that has been you know, significantly impacted, although perhaps you know, really just a short-term blip as opposed to uh, retail, which may be you know, exacerbated more of a seminal progression. Um, what are your thoughts on, on hospitality generally? So interestingly enough, and it might be a little counterintuitive from the lender's seat, um, we actually like the story of a hospitality opportunity or investment where you're not worried about cash flow impairment for the next 12, 18, 24, 36 months. So we might even look a little bit more favorably upon a hospitality development opportunity um, that's delivering or set to deliver into 2023 or 2024, which is hopefully there to capture um, a, a you know more normal operating environment for these hospitality investments, whereby if we're looking at something today that's an existing asset or an operating asset, there's a there's a high likelihood or a higher likelihood that there's some sort of story to it or some sort of um, distress to it. Um, but we're we're certainly making sure if we're looking at an existing asset today in the hospitality space that there's a lot of cash or a lot of equity set aside to make sure that that ownership or us or in some combination of the two is prepared to carry this for a long period of time. Andrew, you mentioned that, that you guys are contemplating a, a hotel development deal, which I, I do find quite interesting. What, um, are, do you think the dynamics are similar? I mean, is, is your reasoning similar to what Kevin just described? Um, yeah, to a certain extent. Um, so we, we do think of hospitality as heavily cyclical. Um, we, probably the last hotel investment we made prior to the onset of COVID was in late 2016. Um, and as the cycle lengthened, you know, we certainly couldn't have predicted the pandemic or anything like it, The the downturn here over the last 12 months has been wildly worse than anything in prior cycles. Um, but there is something to the idea of starting um, at the depths and delivering into what is hopefully the middle of a cycle rather than at the end of a cycle. I think when we look out on the hospitality landscape, what we've seen is tremendous demand to get back out and go on vacation and sort of the, whether it's health and wellness or resort, um, that end of the spectrum, we see really strong demand for buttressed by all the liquidity that people have benefited from in high valuations. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, we see um, strong demand for large groups to get together and meet in person again. Um, and Jake, as you know, that's an area of hospitality we, we've spent a lot of time in and worked on a couple of deals together. And, um, you know, I, I think the part we worry the most about in some ways is more the business transient driven, more urban type locations um, where you know, maybe we're flying for a couple of meetings in a city for an overnight trip, and suddenly now you can do those two meetings over Zoom um, rather than having to go forget about the cost of the travel, but just the loss of the day involved in that and the efficiency gains that come from being able to do some of it virtually. We think that's a longer um, term impact on that segment of demand. Um, and so if we're going to do something, it would probably be either on the leisure and resort side or the large group side. Yeah, I mean, my own observation on what you just said is that, you know, I, I used to travel a lot in what I do at Related. Um, sometimes because it was to go to one of our projects, because we operate around the country uh, as well as in the UK, but a lot of the time to go and meet with institutional investors. And I do think there's a, there's a huge benefit Lifestyle-wise, you know, personally, to to the fact that Zoom or WebEx or Microsoft Teams has become a socially acceptable or a business acceptable way to meet with people, no matter how important the meeting, um, and that's something that the, the it that for whatever reason needed the pandemic to uh, catalyze it, um, and I do think it does have an impact on 
on you know what there will be presumably there'll be winners and losers in that hospitality segment. And, and I think you know Craig, you alluded to some of those factors that that will create the the winners of tomorrow. I think you mentioned you know more drive to locations. Um, obviously, you know focuses on on health and wellness as part of the offering. You know, could you sort of describe like if you were starting from scratch, what's what is the hotel that the that the world needs or even the country needs coming out of this period? So um, well, hopefully we're figuring that out with what we're investing in. But I, I think, or at least part of it, I, and I do think on the higher end, whether the world needs it or not, that's what people want. Um, there is a tremendous desire to go someplace. Um, there, there is this pent up demand that, that Andrew talked about. Um, and I would worry about middle range business hotel. I think those are that, you know, if you don't have to go and corporations even maybe save you money, but I think having a place you can go alone with your wife, with your family, um, maybe it's a second home as well, which has residential, but you can drive from a city and you can have a full suite of recreational amenities as well as real health and wellness, which, you know, six senses, which we work with is really pioneered and you can, there's so much more coming out. One, one thing, for example, is longevity. I mean, there are going to be longevity centers springing up, which you can do. And particularly, again, with the demographic um, that wants to be close to a city, but wants to be able to get away. And then again, highlighted by COVID. Um, I think that's the type of hotel in a pretty setting. I mean, we can think of areas like in New York, an area we've talked about, the Hudson Valley, the Berkshires. I think those sorts of areas are going to, and, and every city has them. Um, but to me, um, it would be a, a, a real sort of rejuvenation retreat where, again, you don't have it. It's not a spa where you're forced to not have wine. You don't have to, if you want to eat cake, you can eat cake, but where there are a whole set of facilities and options for the family, as yeah, well as, as probably as, some educational offerings. As, as Jeff Blau always describes the uh, culinary offerings at the Equinox Hotels, which, which is a, a brand that we've started with, with our partners at Equinox, you know, it's definitely not two peas on a plate. Nobody right. actually knows that. Um, you, want, you want healthy, good food. You want the, the healthy lifestyle, the fitness, the activities that you wish you engaged in in your everyday life. And some people actually do manage that, but it, it's, it's aspirational and it's fun and it's enjoyable. It's not ascetic. I think the fun portions that, and in the, some way, the way I sort of look at it in part is what's the ideal place? If we had to, we had another pandemic in three, four years. Where could I go, even as a hotel guest, feel safe and actually feel good being there with my family and learning and doing all these things? Um, so some of, incorporating some of the safety is, is also part of it, um, because I think in anything we're all doing, that's crucial. I mean, this, this is going to happen again in some fashion. Um, and, we, and so in the real estate business, I mean, we're looking at any property we do about, again, putting in the right things. But I, I do think there's a huge market um, and, and this th thematic and experiential um, differentiates you. So whether it's on wellness, it can be another, it can be an amazing golf resort, but something that gets people. Uh, Philip, uh, I, I don't wanna spend too much time on hotels because I know um, that you have a lot of experience on the residential side and in, in the New York metro area. So we talked about condos a little bit. We didn't really talk at all about the rental side of the equation. You know, so when, when I think about it, I have questions about how you sell all these condos in the New York region and some other places, but mostly in New York. And then how do you fill, out, fill up all the uh, uh, rental units that people you know, somewhat depopulated during the pandemic because they went somewhere else at least for a short period of time. And what, what about this whole single family for rent market, which has really you know, captured a lot of people's uh, interest? Just interested in your perspective on some or all of those things. Sure. So, you know, I think for the first part, um, you know, the, the oversupply of condos in New York is not really a pandemic issue that existed before the pandemic. And that's a very simple um, situation of oversupply and, uh, and lack of affordability. So I think, you know, in Manhattan, if condos were $1,400 a square foot, they'd all sell out today. As ridiculous 
of a price as that is, they would all sell, right? And, and I think the problem is that, you know, at 2000 a foot or, or 2,500 a foot, you know, it, it's a big difference in affordability. And, um, you know, I think a young investment banker could, can swing, uh, you know, a few hundred grand in savings, but not a million in savings. And so, you know, it's a, it's a different, different price point. So I think, you know, there was a, I think that the market lost touch with who the real buyers were. And I think, you know, the entire market was going after the tip of the iceberg, you know, the 0.001%. And that, you know, that's obviously a bad strategy. And I think it just kept on going and land prices and, you know, everybody had a stretch on every deal. And so we've, we've, we've dug our own grave. <laughs> so I think that, you know, we we're, we're fortunate in that we bought a really great site in the West Village. It's a big deal and the West Village doesn't have any other developments and it's a very popular place to live. So that project has been performing well, but it's still a discount. So we're gonna get out of a condo deal with a rental rate of return. And we're happy that it's a rate of return, right? So, so that's, that's sort of my, my, you know, my feeling about the condo market today. I think you do the best that you can. And, you know, if you think you're going to get out with a 30% IRR, like you did four years ago, you know, that's probably not, probably not in the cards. Um, I think with respect to um, multifamily rentals, you know, uh, that's a little bit different. I do think that there are people who are moving from place to place. And, you know, I think that the real, for us, the real opportunity is, you know, looking at the mass migration of people and then seeing what isn't supplied where they're going. So I, I actually was in the hotel business. I used to work for a, a firm called uh, Belmont or Orient Express, and uh, um, which was an amazing, uh, I did development and hotel acquisitions for them. And, um, and I've been in the hotel business and in other realms. And, you know, if, and I'm also from Western Pennsylvania, right? A place that has been overlooked by population migration for, you know, <laughs> a hundred years, but you know, Pittsburgh is now growing. People are trickling back into Cleveland. You know, some people are going to Buffalo. And if you go within a big radius of all those places, there is no hotel to go to. There's nothing nice. There's no place to go on a weekend. And there's plenty of people with money or who want to get away with their wife for the weekend and, and you know, in all those places. So I think, and that, that speaks to Nashville, you know, there, there are a lot of places in the country that have real demand. So, you know, I was in Asheville last week and tons of people are moving to Asheville. You know, the problem with some of these markets is that they don't have scalability. So, it, you know, for you guys who are looking to play 60 billion, you know, what are you going to do in Asheville? You know, if you build a 300 room hotel in Asheville, it'll take you three years to fill it. So, you know, the same thing with residential. So, you know, the, the great, why we're all probably in New York is, you know, a lot of, and why a lot of investment happens here is this, is the scale. You can put a lot of money into a single project and, and it, it has a, a shot at performing. And I think there are still some markets left that, that we'd like to look at um, where there's a migration of people now for sure. You know, we suspect a good portion of them are gonna stay and not return here or to other big cities, but we don't know how many. And we think that those markets are underserved because they just have not, they've had population out migration for so long. And, you know, capital sources like, like and development sources like yourselves haven't really targeted them. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot of amazing opportunities for residential in those places. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of great opportunities for hotels. I, you know, the only question I have is the, how, how big and how deep those markets are, because you just don't know, you know, what a 500,000 person city can absorb. I was also curious, I mean, you're, you're affiliated with a big construction company. And a question that, that I hear asked a fair amount is, you know, during a downturn, a lot of the time, you know, construction prices drop whether it's commodity prices or whether labor is more available. Have you seen evidence of that? No. That's a thing? no, no, and that's very well known that, you know, we're in an inflationary time right now for, for construction. So, you know, all of the stimulus, I mean, this is a real, for construction, it's a terrible combination, right? You have lack of productivity. So people 
can't work because they're either sick or not permitted to go into work. And you have a huge financial stimulus and everybody wanting to renovate their homes or buy a new home or do something else. So that causes real dislocation and inflation in, in the um, construction market. So, you know, I'm in the market on a, on a few different deals right now, uh, getting ready to develop pricing at development and prices are up on development just generally across the board. And, and there's a lot of development happening. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are building smaller projects. There's a lot of uh, people who are taking advantage of low interest rates. There are a lot of single family home buyers who are building new homes now. It is, um, it's a very active construction market, not necessarily from big investors, but from small investors and from mom and pops who are looking to build a home for themselves. And that, that, uh, spirals through the market and uh and and then the reality is you know your construction costs are relatively larger than your land cost in any transaction so if you look for distress you know you might make uh you might get a 25 percent discount on your land which is 20 20 or 25 percent of your capital stack or your you know your costs and your construction, which is 50 or 75% is up 10 or 20%. And it outweighs that, you know, uh, uh, in a significant way. So that, that's what we're seeing in that regard right now. Um, I mean, Kevin, um, you know, Philip say, says, that, and I agree with him, that, you know, there's a lot of activity out there. Are you surprised by the level of, you know, you know inquiries that you're getting for people who want to finance new deals, even given the pandemic? No, I'm, I'm, we're not surprised. There, there is a lot of activity. Uh, I would actually go so far as to say that uh, for for you guys as the beneficiaries on on or you know during this conference, it's a better time to be a borrower today if you own high quality multifamily or high quality industrial or high quality life sciences than it was prior to the pandemic. Um, index rates have fallen meaningfully, and spreads haven't really gapped out to match that. Um, and I think in this interest rate environment and, and in the markets that we've become a lot more active in, um, developers or investors are trying to keep up with that growth. So they're trying to build projects to meet the demand for uh, the, you know, the 50,000 people that moved into Nashville over the past 12 or 18 months. And for the, for the five years leading up to that, they weren't keeping pace and, and now they're trying to catch up. And um, I think there's still a lot of room for, for new development to come on in a lot of these cities and, and. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of them that make sense and we're trying to be a part of them. So I'm curious um, if the panelists, having heard each other talking, usually we'd be sitting on a stage together and we'd be interacting a little bit more naturally. Is anybody dying to ask somebody else a question based on something they heard along the way? I'll go. Um... Kevin, if you had to do the same office construction loan in Nashville a year before COVID, when you did it, and today, how much tighter would pricing have been pre-COVID and today relative to when you did it? It's a great question. I would say um, pre-COVID, it, it probably would have been, call it 100 basis points tighter. Uh, and today, it's probably even it's probably 200 basis points wide of where it would have been in 2019. Um, and I'll say uh, that in 2020, it got done somewhere in the middle, but that was, that was mostly a relationship reason. I have a question for Craig. So I, you know, I, I'm really interested in the um, sustainability um, things that you talked about. And, you know, I look at, you know, I look at sort of, nascent trends and they kind of like they're like bankruptcy right they like take forever and then they happen all at once and um you know and i look at sort of what the pandemic has done overnight and i look at, at you know in a way at sustainability it's something that we've been talking about in the real estate business for 10 years or more 15 years really actively like it's something everybody wanted to pursue and they thought it was going to happen tomorrow you know, when do you think everybody's going to wake up, take it seriously and do what, what they're doing in like the electric car industry, which is like really making a commitment and actually changing the industry? That's a good question. As someone who's been trying to sell the industry, various products for those 10 or 20 years. Um, and then there are leaders. 
you know, I, I, I think one of the things which will drive it is resilience. I mean, there are certain sectors where, again, if you're a real estate owner, I think having, you know, given that we are going to have storms, climate's going to drive things. And I think that one or two more natural disasters, um, I think, will lead people to focus on whether it's fuel cells, um, energy storage separately, certain areas, I think, you know, will come faster. Um, it, it's interesting. We just are selling a food waste company, which is the biggest collection um, food waste company, mainly working with folks like Walmart and the like. But we've seen some major hotel companies um, for no apparent reason that we can see all of a sudden get very interested in, in doing that. And the economics are not there, but I think, you know, as people are reading ESG reports, certain companies, um, if there's pressure from stockholders, I will think we'll look for easy wins. That's an easy win. I mean, you may not have an ROI, but it's not costing you anything to just switch your collections. So I, I, I think it's going to be a combination uh, in certain sectors of really worrying about this sort of pandemic mentality, what can go wrong and how can I effectively, you know, as Kevin said, if you're a lender, what do I want you to put in so you don't have a problem? Um, that will drive certain sectors. And the second thing I do think is either shareholders, customers, particularly on easier things. You know, it's easy to stick, to, if you're a resort, to stick a Tesla charge, you know, an EV charging station. And we all know that's not hard, but there are certain things where there really are no costs um, at the end of the day. Now, really spending money, that's, that's obviously a harder thing. So I, I think you're gonna start seeing some segmentation. Um, and, big, and one of the interesting things we see is continued push on the major corporate side, obviously with the Googles of the world and you know the Apples, but um, even Walmart and companies like that have really been driving a sustainability agenda. How that felt, and they're often sort of schizophrenic about it. I mean, you'll say, why are they doing this but not doing you know these ten more obvious things? But um, so I, I I think we're on the verge, but I sort of been thinking that for five years, six years. So do you think that the do you think the middle of the market will um, will pay a premium. Like in other words, you, you really need to rely on the middle of the bell curve population wise. Do you think that those people will, the same way that the people who are buying electric cars are, are paying more money for it, do you think those people will generally in their lives pay more for sustainability today or, you know? No, no I, I, I don't think so. But, but if you can tie it to something that's good like health, so if I can put in an air system that's actually healthier and I know I'm safer to go to work, or I know I'm not, I have asthma and I'm not getting pollen. I, I think for the middle market, my assumption has been you need to pair it with some other wind. To deliver a benefit. Yeah, yeah. So does we, that we, mean I, that, sorry, does that mean that the cost of implementing these sustainability initiatives needs to come down? I, I think some of them are there, are not so expensive. Um, and some of them with scale will come, you know, it's sort of just right. like, um, some of them with scale are really not so far away. You know, it's, it's once as the Philip said, when do people, when does the flood come? And it sort of is getting people to do it together. So I, I don't, there, there are solutions where, you know, part of the problem, which you guys will all appreciate in the development side is often the people making decisions are facilities, people, particularly retrofits, but even a new development construction companies where, you know, the people, Philip, I don't know, like at your company within the construction side, but they're not the most forward thinking. And um, so I, I think it, it maybe top down will start driving that. I mean, most sustainability officers, you know, have no real power in companies. Um, but I think, you know, th there could be, there are cost effective solutions in many things. And particularly, again, you know, when you get to resilience, I think, um, you know, backup and the like is just good business. Philip, it's a much longer discussion, but um, love to have it with all of you afterwards. So Jake, I'm curious, um, Hudson Yards has been described as the largest private real estate investment in US history. Um, and obviously it was intended to go on for a long period of time and will go across a cycle. H how does the pandemic impact the long-term future of Hudson Yards as you well, see think, it? Um, one thing we already know is that there'll be less retail uh, at Hudson Yards. Um, Neiman Marcus, which was at the top of our shops and restaurants at Hudson Yards, 
uh, rejected their lease in their bankruptcy. Um, and, you know, there's a, you know, potentially a, a better long-term outcome from that event having happened. Um, because as has been reported in, in the press, um, we think that there's a very viable solution for that space, which, which turns it into office space. Um, office, you know, intermediate to long-term being more in demand than department store retail, that's a good thing. Uh, when you compare rental rates and you think about New York City gross rents uh, with a loss factor versus net rents, you know, office versus retail, so there's a lot of, there's a, you know, if, if we are fortunate enough to land one or more tenants for that space in the near term, I think we end up with a better outcome for that space potentially in the long run than we had before. And this is another thing where the, the, the pandemic sort of catalyzed something that may have been sort of a long running question and just sort of brought it to, to uh, brought it very quickly to front and center. Um, it reminds me just on that point when you and I worked together in the financial crisis and borders went bankrupt and they were in a, a pretty big space on the second floor of Columbus Circle and suddenly H&M came through and, and a series of other pieces fell into place and what could have been viewed as a negative outcome suddenly became a positive and, and I right, think and that, that speaks to the strength of location. Oh. In that case, we ended up with, with, with retailers that were more appealing to the shoppers than what had become a little bit of a dead space. Like, who wants to go and buy a book or a CD at a physical store? Now, ironically, at Columbus Circle, we also uh, now have up and running a very, very successful Amazon physical store. Um, so that's the, you know, that's the 21st century incarnation of, uh, of, what, the, of what Borders was. Um, the story um, in the in the in the near term to really watch at Hudson Yards is, um, you know, the, the offices that that we've built, um, as well as the office at Manhattan West um, that Brookfield has, um, the, the the buildings that are substan very substantially pre-leased that are under construction, um, ours um, between uh, 33rd and 34th. Um, and then the Tishman Spire building between 34th and 35th. Um, you know, the office story has been phenomenal at Hudson Yards and um, largely big corporate users in a variety of industries, everything from fashion to tech, um, have recognized the value of modern office space. Um, and I think the pandemic makes it even uh, more noticeable because you, you can actually have proper air ventilation. You can actually distance people on the elevators. I mean, think about an old office building where the problem was, was already with vertical transporta transportation. As you densified offices in New York, you, know, you couldn't get people up and down the elevators at, at high traffic times. Now, you don't want as many people in the elevators, so it only exacerbates that problem. Um, you know, I think that you know, we, um, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a small example, but here at 30 Hudson Yards, um, when the pandemic hit, people back then were really concerned about touching things. I think people are less concerned about touch, but still now aware of it in a way they weren't before. So we worked with our um, elevator manufacturer and uh, implemented an app where now when I walk into the building, I never touch a button. I walk into the building, I swipe on my phone, I wave my hand on the turnstile, uh, which which gives me access to the building, and then the elevators know I'm coming and know that we have a we have a transfer floor, a sky lobby. And the elevator takes care of all the rest. I never touch a button. Um, those types of things, those types of innovations, come out of um, uh, in some instances necessity and adversity. So anyway, modern the story of having modern office that can provide the types of amenities, can provide provide the conditions that even in a non-pandemic period can people that can pe make people feel happy and well and healthy in their offices. I think that's a very good story. And I think that's why it was already working. And that's why I'll take it to continue to work. And Hudson Yards is not just the Eastern Rail Yards development that related, um, you know, started with. It's also this broader area that includes your multifamily development and a bunch of other development, you know, the new generation of development in New York City. So I, I'm actually still pretty bullish, I must say. 
So one thing I was curious about is whether panelists have any words for the students. And I, I would love to start with Philip, uh, who himself is an MS Red graduate. Uh, so um, being a person who's from Western Pennsylvania and has the fortune of living in New York and uh, but loves where they're from, I would say that um, uh, I, w I went into the program over 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And, uh, you know, I was really interested in, um, in real estate development and, and sort of improving the built environment. And I didn't know anything about it. And I came to New York to learn about how cities are built and how construction and design happens and what architects do. And, um, you know, I've stayed here for a lot, uh, but I've also now more, more recently spent some time investing in my home markets. And I think that for young people, you know, to learn um, how to do something, you know, here from the best people in the world and uh, getting contacts with the best financial sources in the world, but bringing it back home and investing um, in your home communities and trying to do something that's interesting, um, you know, in a secondary city um, is something that, you know, can really help a lot of people, um, both, uh, you know, people who are in need and also, just to create a, a more uh, interesting built environment. And I think post COVID those opportunities um, are gonna exist more than they ever have, uh, at least in the last 20 years that I've been in the business. You know, Everybody's been moving from smaller towns to bigger cities and there may actually be an opportunity to develop something and, and make some money in a smaller town. So I encourage people to, uh, uh, you know, learn, learn where you learn, um, but uh, bring your expertise home. Jake, I'll, I'll jump in there if, uh, if no one else. Um, I would just say um, that the, the real estate industry is a, is a big and vast place and there's a lot of different ways to, to make money in it or make an impact uh, on the industry. So um, find your niche and find something that you're passionate about. It may take some time or may take some iterations um, early on in your career, but find it and, and chase it hard and um, ultimately you'll be successful and, and hopefully make a change to the industry. I'd echo that. I think um, probably 75% of the people we interview, when you ask them why they want to get involved in real estate and we're on the, the finance side and the investor side, they'll say, I love the tangibility of it or something to that effect. Um, and it's really easy when you're on this side of the business to lose your connection to that um, and to sit behind a desk and get buried in a model or documents or or aspects of the business that take you away from actually experiencing the real estate. Um, and so I strongly encourage people wherever they wind up in the industry to get out, actually touch property, go through a development process from whatever seat you're in um, and see how it happens because there are parts of it, um, certainly you'll learn things, there are parts of it that are magical um, and hopefully it'll help remind you why you wanted to get into the business in the first place. So I would just say, give two pieces of advice. One is the is general advice. There will be cycles. We're talking about cycles now. There are going to be great cycles, bad cycles. And if you have vision and staying power, you'll be fine. Um, timing's always a good thing, but, but expect that to happen. We may not have COVID like this, but you'll experience some downturns. There'll be some tremendous upturns. Um, I, I do think one of the wonderful things COVID has shown, this is the second bit of advice where, where I, as someone who comes later to real estate, but loves the, the development side and, and the involvement, um, the tangibility, the fact COVID has shown how important where we live, how much time we spend indoors, uh, quality of being with people. Um, you have such an ability to influence people and, and projects like Huts and Yards obviously have you know, touched so many people, but it can be small scale as Philip said, Communi it can be community development, um, real estate is it, it nothing technology is going to replace the need for us to have great spaces to work in and live in. And Craig, I, I agree with you on that word people. Um, you know, real estate, there's a lot of different facets of real estate. Like we run internship programs at Related in the summer, uh, and we have interns in, in construction, in development, in marketing, in sales leasing, HR. Um, what's great about those opportunities um, is the people at my company, the people on this panel, um, if you're looking for sort of the next step as you, as you, you know, go into your next job, you know, 
really ask yourself, are these people I'm going to be want to be on a Zoom call with or sitting in the office with many, many hours a day? That makes a huge amount of difference um, within this vast, complicated uh, industry vertical we're in. You know, just your own personal happiness will have to do with the people that you're going into that business with. So that's that's my little bit of advice.